my eyes strain to sleep, even while I hurry over the railway bridge as the pit looms up out of the mists. Mouth dry and thick encroaching fog begs you to sit down right here, curl up and sleep as you would have done, crouched in the bush shelter, donkey jacket lapels turned up against the wind, if you got out of bed ten minutes earlier. The alarm, shrill and painful, stabs into your consciousness. You leave the warm bed, leave the warm shapely body next to you, roll with eyes still closed into the shock of the icy cold morning and ice cold clothes. This morning you lay too long, pretending the alarm had been a dream, pretending you still had an hour before it actually went off. I hope, Maureen would prompt. Aye, he would lie, and then let the nothingness slide you back under. Dave, you'll miss the bus. Damn the bus, and damn the pit. I want to sleep, but don't damn Maureen. Not for me to shoot the messenger, outraged against the wife's urgent promptings. For it is her who has to manage on the budget, minus the shift's money if you knock. Stagger around the silent living room, taking the pit clothes from the fire guard and stove where they've hung up to dry, still smelling of soap powder and coal dust, the bait made up in the pork. Then out of the door into the sea of icy fog. Seven hundred men are rolling from their beds, clumping down from Stanford, Hatfield or Dunstroft, silently, sullenly, heading for the pit. An army of cloth caps and woodbines are boarding the buses at moor ends and thorn. The army of underground labour is up and on its way and scarcely a sound. The canteen is almost barren of men by the time I arrive, identity check in hand, rush through the baths, envious of the naked bodies in the showers coming off shift, warm water and steam rising through the corridor, songs echoing with the steam, then drift in, lamp bouncing with the herd of humpty backs, jackets flying, packy juice apostrophed, water bottles slung, climb the steel stairwell to the cage, struggling with those last few steps, as the men said, if they'd just get rid of those last two stopped steps, the stair would be no climb at all, shuffling forward, 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 the draw dropping away, down and down, and then rising as hot air rushes up through the chains and the gantries into the morning mist, and the cage gate thrusts open, in you gone, wound up against the mesh, struggling to keep your feet on the wet iron floor. This is the last draw. Everyone must get on, or gone away yem and be paid out for all that effort. As the cage lifts off the caps, a moment's silence, then away with a gust of wind, down, down, shaft water slashing in, salty but refreshing, all lights off, blackness and the nearness of bodies and the crack. So I says to Wallace this morning, Oh, can I gone this morning? It's white all hour. She sits up. She says, Why, there's no snow on them roofs, pet. I know, but I haven't gone that way. Another says, Aye, mine says, uh, Hey, you love you put your boots on the wrong feet. I says, I know, they should be on your buggers. The laughs are louder. So I says to this bird with the web feet, Hey, up duck. Just laugh, man. Fuck it, just laugh. As the cage is slowing, slowing and the light from the pit bottom break into view. As we push past the late riders, black and bloodied, smelling of powder reek, coal dust and stale water. Run with your battery bouncing into the small of your back and jump into the paddy. Crush and wriggle your arse into the tight confines of the roller coaster carriage as the paddy guard waves, there's off, with his cap lamp. A shower of hot water and a cloud of diesel fumes spurt into the air and envelop the coaches as we set off. Prop your feet up, but keep them inside the coach and don't nod off to the left. The coach skims a paddy road wall with broken boards and jutting rocks and splintered iron sheets. Nod that way and beheed yourself. Nod to the right and this big, hairy, unshaven ripper will stick his tongue in your ear. So just come out of the gear, but stay running. Today I psych myself up. I will take whatever man or nature throws at me. I will do whatever they can do. I will make up in speed what I cannot match in strength. Am I on trial? God, yes I am. Sparrow's team. The most conscientious, hard-working rippers at the pit. Some would say lackeys. I have been put with this team to make me or break me. They intended to break me. I was an unpopular, red ragging little Geordie bastard. I had had the divisive inter-union anti-four-shift strike laid at me door. The branch had voted on the 5th of January 1969 for the third time to reject four shift working. We failed and got landed with four shifts per 24 hours instead of three. 6 a.m. Day shift. This bastard. The one the stupid Yorkshire twats called a good shift. 
1.30. After you got back home, half past nine just in time for your dinner and a pint if you still felt like it. Then 6 p.m. shift. Get in just after 2 a.m. or work in bed. And finally midnight shift. You were going out to work while others were putting the lights off for bed. On a Friday men were staggering from the pub as we suckers suck at, slunk out to work. What a system. It had been worth a fight. But the pit was divided. It was an unofficial strike. Half the officials were for it, half against. I had been in the element. My cloth cap with a peak turned up and what I thought was a sort of a Lenin style with the red Mao badge in front. For good measure I was now wearing the regulation beard and my hair was long and bushy from the daily showering. Addressing the masses as they swarmed through the corridor to the token cabin. Comrades and fellow workers, we aren't the nuts and bolts. We aren't the machines. We have lives away from the pit. We work to live, remember? We don't live to work. What's that daft cunt on about? I remember my fellow workers commenting. I had stopped the pit with the pit bottom lads using the coupling block in a work to rule against the dire conditions of the pit bottom. It landed me before the manager. What would you do with him? The manager asked Tom, the union man with the left wing reputation, brought in to defend me. I would sack him, he responded. The union man had earlier attacked, I had earlier attacked in correspondence to Frank Watters, the Communist Party organiser in the coal fields. Frank knew a trot when he saw one and passed the correspondence back to Tom so he had me and my letter. On the occasion of the grand disciplinary hearing before the Corrie manager, the moderate union secretary Frank Clark, who I had also clashed with, stepped in and asked how many lads had been killed on that job. Two, I think, said the manager. So we can't discipline a lad for protecting his own safety, can we? It worked. And I learnt a lesson about moderates and militants. Before top falling out with Milani, I had confided my indecision between anarchism and Trotskyism. Milani was later able to publicly attack me as an anarchist Trotskyist, which would have confused them down in the Kronstadt. Yeah, where are we? Well, so I had landed with the no-nonsense Sparra team, so-called after Keith the Chargeman and the all-round star Stoneman Go-Getter. This was a hand-bored, fired and hand-filled canch. Every pound of stone which went on the chain lowered the vend and spoiled the run of mine. So it had to be packed, 12 yards of pack on my side, 6 yards on the other. The paddy stops at the meeting station amid a clatter of men unloading chains, shovels, bags of shot fire and powder. For me is a long walk of 22's tailgate. It is miles long and like a sauna. Clouds of dust and heat seep, heat seep from its entrance and into the paddy road. As we arrive at the gate end there is time to flop for a minute. Grab a board as a backrest, squat on a chalk piece, grab a bit bait on your slice it's still early and the belly still feels like wrenching and there is hard merciless slug ahead. Cheese and tomato, same every day. Wouldn't have it any other way. It's like a piece of kindness in a world of cold hardness. By the time I get up, knee pads tight to the knees, leave the bait poke and the gate hung up and start to look under the canch. The colliers are arriving and stripping off before going under the rip. With my oil lamp in my hand, I duke under the canch. Bloody hell, they've cut out a football pitch. A huge expanse of ground stands exposed and unsupported. It sits like a monstrous slab, just waiting another tickle of movement and the lot will be in. The cutters are supposed to stop cutting after one web width to give us the chance to support the exposed ground, sling packs on, advance bull rails and props, but they haven't, sloppy bastards. They've just kept cutting, makes them look like the big hewer, big hitters, just keep roaring it out in a great wave, never thinking of the weight being thrown onto the tailgate end or the potential for disaster. As if to make things worse, this is a flooded pack hole. Foul smelling black water covers everything a foot deep. The water is already over me boots. This is going to be another good shift. Welcome home. Another team of rippers would have ragged up at this. Not this team. If you moan, it's because you're scared or too lazy to meet the challenge. <laughs>